Amen. Good morning, New Life Church. Thank you. You guys look fantastic. You look great. Guys, you can go ahead and wait on the folks. Um, you sounded wonderful in worship. It's been a, it's a beautiful day. We got a little bit of rain yesterday. A little bit. We got a lot of rain yesterday. Every time it rains, the first thought across that goes in my head is, this is good for our yard. <laughs> okay. I guess you guys weren't excited about that. Uh, let me mention a couple of things. I do have a, a special announcement that I do want to make, but before we do that, please just bear with me if you would. I, a couple of announcements I do want to make. First of all, I want to let you know that um, the uh, every first Wednesday of the month, we have a, a Wednesday night service. And so the first Wednesday, uh, actually it's this coming Wednesday, is our first Wednesday. Isn't that right? This coming Wednesday is our first Wednesday. No, it's the one after that. Uh, why am I announcing it then? Anyway, it's on the 7th, February 7th, and so that's always a great time. It's going to be a great time of worship and uh, just recharging ourselves. The other thing I wanted to mention is our marriage conference. With uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actually going to be streamed live, but it's with Jimmy Evans, Jimmy and Karen Evans, as well as some other incredible speakers. We do this once a year, and so that's right here in this room. And uh, um, I think it's in this room. Well, it's here at the church. And um, it's on the 9th and 10th of February, 9th and 10th of February. And then February 18th, February 18th is our first, for 2018, our first made new service. So we have baby and children dedications as well as water baptisms. It's going to be a powerful service. Really looking forward to it, especially the first one of the year, uh, of the new year. And um, so if you've given your life to Christ and you've never been water baptized, I'm telling you, there is a blessing, a spiritual blessing. You don't want to miss this opportunity. So I want to encourage you to sign up for that. You can do that at the Welcome Center. And uh, it is a powerful, powerful time. And even if you're not being water baptized, it's a powerful time. It happens during our worship uh, our worship service, the, our worship and song. And then, of course, we always have uh, an encouraging word that... Um, and I'll be sharing that, that, that morning, of course. And so uh, really looking forward uh, to that. But that's really important, made new. You don't, you don't want to uh, miss that opportunity. And, that's a power. and really, honestly, that is one of the best services to invite a friend. One of the best services to invite. I'm telling you, it's one of the best services to invite a friend. By the way, I know on your seats there's, these little, there's some invite cards and packets. I want to encourage you to, to grab some of those, take those with you. If, you. if someone grabbed one before you got a hold of it, we've got a bunch more there at the Welcome Center. Folks, let me just say this. At the first of the year, you know, one of the things that's so interesting if you go to the gym, right, is that the gyms pack out at the beginning of the year. You ever notice that? Those New Year's resolutions. And a lot of times folks are the same way about, about their relationship with God and about spiritual things. So this is a great time of year to be inviting our friends. Now, having said that, let me mention two other things real quick here. They kind of go hand in glove. So just thank you for your patience. Uh, but the other thing I want to mention is um, our uh, South Campus has been meeting at Luther Jones Elementary School. And we really were getting tight there and it really needed more room. And so many of you know we announced this last weekend. Uh, and then it was on our, face, on our Facebook page and all of that. So they, they actually, and they meet at 10 o'clock, by the way. So they met during our 10 o'clock service. And so their new location is Grant Middle School, and that was today. That was this morning. Of course, Pastor Zane and Priscilla are right here. And so uh, credible volunteers over there. Pastor Zane is our campus pastor there. He and his incredible wife and just in the fantastic team out there. Well... We knew we needed to make more room, so we were able to find this this middle school, Grant Middle School, and it, it was a lot. It was it's more room. It's room for us to grow. Well, they ran out of chairs today, and they had to borrow chairs from the school, and so I love that. All the more reason why you want to get those invite cards. I'm telling you, we're not working on our own here. The Holy Spirit is alive and well in Corpus Christi, and people are looking for a place to experience the presence of God in a real way, right? It is not hard. It is not hard. And so uh, grab those invite cards, invite somebody. Let's continue to pray for our South Campus. I'm telling you, mark my words, they're going to outgrow that school. We're going to, actually this week we're going to get more chairs. We're going to buy some more chairs. So uh, if you want to give a little extra to the chairs, you can do that. But we're buying more chairs this week. I don't know if you're real, you got to buy more chairs. We, 
We're not allowed to use the school's chairs. We use them today, but we're not, shh, we're not allowed to do that. So we're going to buy chairs this week. So if anybody wants to help us buy chairs, that'd be great. But, um, and we're going to make more room for more people. That's what we said we were doing and moving, and God is bringing them. And so look, this is a, this is a great, uh, this is an exciting time. And having said that, I, I know that I, we announced that I, had a, that I had a special announcement. We put that on Facebook. Some of you, maybe a lot of you didn't see that there's a special announcement. A lot of you probably I have heard about it. I, well, I know there's a lot of you that heard about it. And you're trying to guess. I had so many people private messaging me on Facebook. Just tell me. I won't tell anybody. And I didn't give in at all. I was a rock. So people were wondering, is Bonnie pregnant? No, Bonnie's not pregnant. That's not it at all. I hope not. You're not pregnant, are you? No, okay. No, she's not pregnant. That'd be like Abraham and Sarah having a baby. And, uh, well, no, that's not right. I shouldn't say that. That would be like Abraham having a baby. Bonnie, of course, is only in her 30s. So, uh, but it's not that. And somebody said, Pastor Mike's running for president. That's not, no, it's not that. Um, no, it's not that. Um, but here is the announcement. Here's what's, here's what's happening. And it kind of goes along with, um, just with the South Campus and just what God's doing here at New Life. And this is, I've been really looking forward to announce, to, to sharing this with you. But um, let me just say this real quick and kind of go back. If you remember after Hurricane Harvey came through and, um, of course, that weekend, nobody had church, obviously. And, um, and then we met that Wednesday and then we met the following Sunday. Well, the following Sunday, if you were here, and a lot of us were not here because we were still kind of scattered because of the storm. But those of you that were here, you remember that I really shared that I feel like the Lord really, really got a hold of my, my heart and my mind over this. I, of course, um, our hearts went out to and, and continue to go out to those who were impacted by the storm, Rockport, Port A, and, and the surrounding areas. Um, but then I also couldn't help but think what would have happened if it hadn't veered further north. Not that, of course, we're not moved or impacted with uh, compassion and, and with prayers uh, for the folks there. But I thought, what would have happened if it hadn't? What would have happened if it annihilated and just leveled this building? Uh, you just never know. And I just thought, my goodness, I really felt very strongly that we need to, um, we need to be in the best position we can. That's why we have life groups, by the way. So we're constantly connected with each other relationally. Um, because it's so important. That's what makes a church a church. But then I thought about what if we'd... What if the Hurricane Harvey had blown our building uh, uh, down or something? And I really felt very impressed um, that we needed to, and I announced this on that Sunday after Hurricane Harvey, that we needed to do what we could to come up with a strategy to pay off this building, this property. So uh, let's say something did happen to this. For us to duplicate this building, for example, to literally just duplicate what we have, 40,333 square feet, and the parking lot that we're able to have access to and all of that, to duplicate all of that, just this, not any bigger, just exactly this. If we were to build it right now, find land and build it, you're talking about $7.5 million probably, close to that, maybe even a little bit more actually. And, uh, but what we owe on this is only $2.4 million. Now, I know some of you are thinking only two point. No, think about it. If we had to replace this, listen, $7.5 at least seven and a half million dollars. But we only owe 2.4 on this. And one of the things we realize that if everybody that gives already, those of you that already give faithfully, if all of us who did that just gave ten dollars above what we normally give, just ten thousand is it ten dollars a ten dollars a week above what we normally give in three years, that's two point four million. And here's my thought about that. I love the idea of putting more money in people than in brick and mortar. Amen? I think people are eternal. Brick and mortar, hurricanes like Harvey can wipe them out. But people are going to live forever somewhere. Amen? <laughs> and so we, we talked about that on, on that Sunday. I mentioned that we're, we're going to come. And we are. We're going to share with you a strategy and a, 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 really a spiritual journey that I think we can go on together 
over the next three years and see this building paid off and not put not give money to a bank and that money we give to a bank on a monthly basis we give towards ministry we give towards people but one of the other things that I said is that we had committed to the south campus we're doing that it's growing it's it's doing so well but I said we're not going to launch another campus until we pay this building off we're not going to do another campus until I felt like that was just a responsible thing to do and so what I didn't realize is as I was sharing this just kind of I hadn't planned on sharing it by the way I was just which makes the staff nervous at times when I'm sharing stuff that I haven't we haven't talked about but I just shared it and it was just on my heart and I just it just came out but while I was doing that there was a pastor and his wife here in our service and their uh, and that pastor's son and his wife and the pastor's just getting ready to turn 80 here soon and his wife were in our service and they passed her church in Aransas Pass they weren't able to have service because of the hurricane and then his son and uh, and, and his son's uh, wife were there and I think they're you know I think they're, they're, well they're old enough to have college kids because two of their kids actually are members here at, uh, uh, at, at New Life Church and part of our young adults they were in the service and they heard me say that we really had, uh, that God had given us a vision to establish, but we weren't, we were going to pay this building off first before we started another campus. But our vision was to have campuses all throughout the coastal bend area that had live people, they're not me on video, and live worship, but young men and women leading those campuses, preaching, pastoring those people, loving on them but all New Life Church campuses all throughout the Coastal Bend area. Do you remember, I don't know if you remember me saying but I was saying all that. And as I was saying that, they were in the service. And, and uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, they were poking each other, elbowing one another. And uh, that was around, uh, you know, the middle of September, thereabouts. And then at the end of September, I got a, a text message. And the son wanted to meet me on behalf of the pastor. And uh, we met at my home. And the pastor, as I said, is I think either just turned 80 or getting ready to turn 80. He's been at that church for 34 years, almost 35 years, faithfully pastoring that church in Aransas Pass. And, um, and he's, he knows that this is, season's over in his life. He's stepping down, needs to retire. And he, they were sitting there trying to figure out what are we going to do with this church. And when, we, when I was talking about the vision that God had given us, God began to stir their hearts. They were, all, of course, already familiar with New Life Church and, and what God is doing here and obviously value it, respect it, are excited about it. And so when he met with me, he said, we want to know if you'd be willing to take over the church. And I said, well, we're not, we don't want to buy it. We're, we're, we're on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a journey here where we're going to pay off this, the building that we have before we plan any other campuses. He says, no, we're not talking about you buying it. We own the building. We own the property. We've owned it for years. We're talking about giving it to New Life Church and just deeding it over to the church. So it's, uh, so there's, there's a couple of uh, nice metal frame, beautiful metal frame buildings. There's a brick and mortar building. There's buildings there. There's five acres there. It's in a great location in Aransas Pass. And of course, I met with the elders and we obviously said we would do that. They had offers of people in the private sector, businesses wanting to buy the property, but they wanted to keep it in use for the kingdom of God. And so they asked if we would do that, and we said, of course, that we would do that. And so that's what's happening. They've already announced it to the church. So that's where I was last Sunday. I wasn't here. Pastor Alex was preaching, and the reason why is because I was in Aransas Pass speaking to the congregation there. And they had announced it, I think, three or four weekends ago now. And so that's what's happening. They'll be deeding that property to us. We'll be giving you some more information on what that's going to look like. Um, and uh, we're going to ultimately here have uh, our first uh, debt-free campus in Aransas Pass. I think that's, we didn't plan on that, but that's pretty awesome. So uh, we knew eventually we would get there. We knew eventually we'd get to Aransas Pass, but we obviously weren't planning on this. But apparently God was. And so we just really believe it's a God thing. And it's been a God thing and well received by the folks there. And uh, so, um, so for example, bon, um, I would have had Pastor... Now, the pastor's name is Pastor Gene Hale. And I would have had Pastor Gene and his wife here with us today. But it's their, I don't know, 
I'm not sure what anniversary it is, but it's a lot, obviously. Um, and uh, so they're, they, it's their anniversary this week, and so that's not why that's, they're not here. And then Bonnie and I are going to be gone this, this coming Sunday. For the next two Sundays, we're gone. Now, that, I almost hesitate to tell you that, but it's too late. I already told you. This is not a time to play hooky. Okay? Uh, and so um, we've got some great things happening. Uh, we're going to be launching a new series uh, starting next Sunday. And we've got some neat things happening with worship and all of that. So uh, I want you to come. But then the following weekend is our made new service our water baptism service, and pass, and we'll be back. So actually, Bonnie and I are going to be gone. Uh, we're going to be in Israel. And uh, we've never been to Israel, so we're, gonna, we're going to Israel. And so when I come back, I'm sure I'm going to be fired up. I'm telling you, I know that. You know, being everywhere where Jesus was, I'm going to probably, I'm going to come back, and it's going to, you're just going to buckle up because it's going to be. I'm not saying I'm going to preach longer. It's just going to be, I'm probably a little fiery. Um, but uh, so we're looking forward to that. But uh, and we're also going to try to greet you from Israel. I don't know if it's going to work. We're going to try to do a little video thing because we'll be ten hours ahead, and uh, I'm going to try to get some footage of me walking on the Sea of Galilee. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not walking on the Sea of Galilee. Um, but when we come back, that'll be the made new service when we come back. And uh, and then Pastor Gene Hale will be with us. I'll, I asked him just to take a few moments and just greet us as a congregation. And we need to honor him and his wife. Uh, you give honor where honors do, but they have been faithful ministers of the gospel for over 30 some years, 40, 50 years. They've faithfully served, and so it's just a beautiful thing. So it's really neat, isn't it? We didn't plan on that, but man, let's thank God for that. All right. So, are you ready to get into the scriptures? Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, we're closing out our series today, Better Than Before. We're going to be talking about our thought life, how to control those crazy thoughts and the emotions that go along with them. And so we're, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going to take a look at the scriptures. I'm going to reference a verse of scripture here in Ecclesiastes. You don't have to worry about turning there. That'll be on the screen. Turn to 2 Corinthians, though, if you would. We're going to take a little bit more time in that passage of Scripture and break that down a little bit in the time that we have left. But the whole idea of thoughts is a big deal. We all deal with them. We all deal with those crazy, crazy thoughts that get the better of us. Here's what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Wise thinking leads to right living. Stupid thinking leads to wrong living. I got to be honest with you, I've been on both sides of that fence. I've made some great decisions in my life. I've made some really good choices in my life. And every time I've done it, it's when I've allowed the Word of God and what is right and truth and God's Word to guide my thinking. Then I've made great decisions, and I know you have too. And then there's other times in my life where I've allowed my thoughts and my emotions to get the better of me, and I've made foolish and stupid decisions, and I know, I know I'm not alone in that. Okay. And so, but we've all been on both sides of that. We've all experienced that. But the reason why this verse is so important to start off with today is because it reminds us of the importance of our thoughts. Let me just say it this way. Our minds will always move in the direction of our most dominant thought. So it brings us to the first point, and that is this. When it comes to the enemy trying to trip us up, derail us, unravel us, dismantle us, affect us, impact us, steal from us, rob from us, let me tell you something, folks. The ultimate battlefield is not our flesh. We know. We do battle with that. But the ultimate battlefield, ground zero, is not our flesh. It's our mind. It's our mind, it's our thoughts, it's battling those thoughts, it's knowing what to do with those thoughts, how to experience the power that God's given us through his word to take captive those thoughts. And that's exactly what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that means they don't derive their strength from our ability, our humanity, but they are mighty in God. For the pulling down of strongholds, if, just bear with me and, and just say strongholds with me if you would. Strongholds, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Isn't that where we need to be, right? That's what needs to be happening. Now, there are times where that does happen, happen for us, and then there's a lot of times where that doesn't happen for us. What we want to do is we want to increase the number of times that we make those wise choices because our thinking's right, and we want to decrease the amount of times in our lives where we're letting those ungodly thoughts and emotions control us, right? So we want to be better than before in 2018 than we were 2017. I'm telling you, that is not... That is not a pipe dream. That is not over the rainbow stuff. That is for real. We can experience that. This year, you're going to be able to look back and go, you know, I think God had more control of my thoughts this year than he did the year before. I'm telling you. Does that sound good? And so Paul's explaining to us how this happens. But first of all, he's really kind of in this passage in 2 Corinthians, he's really kind of laying out for us. The the nature of this warfare, this battleground of the mind, this battlefield of the mind, he's kind of laying out how the enemy does this. He's actually exposing in this passage, he's exposing our solution, or he's showing us the solution, but he's first exposing the devil's strategy. He's exposing our enemy's scheme, the battle plan, which is great. The Holy Spirit wants us to know Satan's strategy here. So Paul in this passage really exposes that. And he exposes it by, first of all, talking about this idea of pulling down strongholds. Well, just the word stronghold itself, the definition of that word exposes or reveals Satan's plan, his ploy, how he gets a hold of our brain, our minds, our souls, our emotions, and, and so that word stronghold, and actually here's a great definition, very simple uh, definition and really a, a, I think a real telling definition of stronghold. And a stronghold is this, a, strong, a stronghold is a system of thought, a system of thought empowered by emotions. So it's a thought that, that, that is contrary to God or contrary to truth. But we embrace it. And why do we embrace it? Because he injects it with emotions. Meaning, I know I'm right. How do you know? Because I feel so strongly about it. (laughs) Right? But I've discovered that passion isn't always an indication of accuracy. Just because I feel strongly about something doesn't mean I'm right about it. I feel strongly about a lot of things. And when I was in my 20s, I felt strongly about everything. Then as you get older, you kind of realize you don't need to feel that strongly about everything. A lot of stuff you feel strongly about doesn't really matter anyway. I'll tell you something else too as a side note. The older you get, the more you realize you don't know. It's when you're 18 that you're convinced you know everything. (laughs) And your parents are limited greatly mentally. But you got it. And that's how you feel until you're about 50, and then you realize, my parents were actually brilliant, and I don't know anything, <laughs> right? Am I true? That's the, and that's the prayer of every parent, that our children get to that point. Amen. But it's this idea that a stronghold, very simply, is Satan plants a thought, an idea, a paradigm, a perception, a mindset, a conception. And he plants this thought in our minds and he injects it with these strong feelings because that's what cements it to us. That's what convinces us to forge through, to kind of thunder through towards that bad decision. Like the man who's convinced that he's in love and feels strongly and passionately about his secretary. And he doesn't love his wife any longer, but now he loves her. And so... And so, but he's convinced that, and then he convinces himself that this is right. And if he's a Christian, I've heard guys say, well, I feel like the Lord really showed me that this is really my soulmate. She completes me. And, but then you're like, well, what about your wife? Well, that was kind of a mistake. We got married for all the wrong reasons. Who didn't? Very few of us. Some of us got married for the right reasons. Some of our young men here. Young pastors lived godly lives. They got married for the right. Almost a lot of us, you can find a lot of reasons why we shouldn't have got married. You know, we were too young. We didn't know what we were doing. We were too poor. Our parents were this. We had this background, this past. We started off wrong. We had sex before we got married. Oh, it's all kinds of stuff. 
And so we, he convinces himself, well, that never really, that, you know, that, that, no, God's changed it. Now it's over here. And I've watched men just push through all common sense and reasoning and destroy their families and leave their wives and try to start a new life with this new gal. And they're convinced they're doing the right thing. Everybody around them knows this is the dumbest thing anybody could ever do, ever, except them. That's the stronghold, right? And we have made maybe not as dramatic uh, types of choices like that, but we've made decisions in our lives that everybody knew we were making a mistake except us. We were convinced this thought was right. It was valid. We felt strongly about it. We're going to forge through against wise counsel, against the scriptures, against the truth. We're going to do it. Does this make sense, everybody? That's a stronghold. Now, left to ourselves, we have no, we, we, we have no uh, counterattack to that at all. We're going to just, our lives are going to be dismantled by the enemy. But Paul said there's good news. We have weapons that are greater than any weapon of the enemy, even a stronghold in our thoughts. Our weapons are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, okay? And he also says, casting every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, that word high thing, it's, that, that's actually translated two English words. It's actually one word in the original Greek, which is hoops, the Greek word hoopsoma, which doesn't really mean a lot. The definition, though, is important. The definition of that word high thing is barrier. Another definition of that, of that word is it, it refers to a, a solid wall, wall-like wall structure that's raised for defense. What Paul is saying is that here he's exposing the strategy of the, de- of the devil. He says the enemy is going to plant these goofy thoughts in your head. And he's going to convince you they're right because he's going to He's going to give strong emotions to it. You're going to feel strongly about it. But in actuality, they're not right. In actuality, those very thoughts are going to hem you in. They're going to wall you in. You're going to be a prisoner to those thoughts. They're going to become a barrier or a ceiling. You'll never, your marriage will never rise beyond it. Your life won't rise beyond it. Your home and your family will never rise. He's going to take you captive with these thoughts. But we have weapons that are mighty in God to the pulling down of those strongholds and those high things. And instead of us being taken captive, we in turn take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. Uh, You see what I'm saying? This is the daily battle, folks. This is the daily battle. This is something we do every... But this is the victory that's promised us every day. But this is also the deception we face almost on a daily basis. Thank God for those weapons mighty in God. Can I get an amen on that? Thank God for those. And what is the primary mighty weapon in God that God's given us? That brings us to point two, and that is this. The ultimate weapon against deception is God's word. What is that mighty weapon? The the primary mighty weapon that we have is what Paul refers to in Ephesians 6 in the armor of God is the belt of truth. It's the thing that's central to every area of our lives. It is the Word of God. The Bible. See, here's what what we need to realize. The conflict and the battle ultimately isn't between us and the devil. Ultimately, the conflict that's going on that we're dealing with is between the devil and God's Word. It's not about us. We're collateral damage if we allow the devil to win. But the conflict, this whole conflict, we're getting pulled into it every day, folks. But it's about the devil trying to overpower God. And and the devil doesn't mind destroying our lives in the process. God is saying, you belong to me. You don't belong to the devil. You don't have to be collateral damage. This isn't about you and the devil. This is about the devil and me. So let me fight that battle. Let my word destroy those strongholds and those high things. Let me give you an example. Great example of that is when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Now, starting next week, we're going to start this series entitled The War Within. Now, this, none of this, what I'm saying today, is a spoiler alert. None of it is going to mess up the series. But we're going to talk about how to battle temptation. 
and we're going to use the, 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 uh, the time where Jesus was in the wilderness in Matthew 4, and he was tempted by the devil, okay? And so, and, and so with that being said, talking about this conflict is not between us and the devil, it's between the devil and God. Here Jesus is in the wilderness. He's fasted 40 days and 40 nights, so he's at the point of starvation, and first of all, when the devil came to tempt Jesus, he came to tempt Jesus with thoughts. Turn these stones into bread. Well, when you're starving and you know you can do it, that's a temptation. Does this make sense? The second temptation was go to the top of the, of the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself down. And God will cause his angels to give charge or to protect you lest you even bruise your foot against a stone. The third temptation, the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give all of this to you. That's crazy. It was all his anyway. It all belonged to Jesus anyway. But do you notice how Jesus responded? If you, and we'll see, we'll actually really go through this in more detail in the next few weeks here in February. But how Jesus responded to this is so powerful. And it, and it drives home this idea of who... who where the conflict is, who it's really between. It's not about us. It's between God and the devil. So how, how did Jesus respond to every one of those, those three temptations in Matthew 4? Jesus said the same thing every single time. The devil said, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil said, go to the top of the temple, throw yourself down. And Jesus says, it is written. You shall not tempt the Lord your God and put him to the test. And then the devil said, bow down and worship me and I'll give all of this to you. And Jesus said, it is written that man shall worship God and him alone shall he worship. So how, how did Jesus face off with the devil? Jesus realized that even in his own, de- he didn't even rely on his own deity, his own godness to battle the devil because Jesus knew that while he was on this planet, the conflict wasn't between him and the devil. It was between the devil and God. And so Jesus says, let me get out of the middle here. It is written. It is written. It is written. This is what the word of God said. And he just kept pounding the devil with the word. <laughs> He just pounded him with the word. And that's exactly what we need to do. That's how we take captive those thoughts, that we realize that the word of God is the thing that helps expose the deception. It's not about what our opinion is or how strongly we feel about it or what we think. That's not what matters. It doesn't matter what mom and dad think. It doesn't matter what grandma and grandpa think, ultimately. It doesn't matter. Well, it does until grandma and grandpa get off of the Bible. Or until mom and dad tell us to do something that's contrary to the scriptures. See? But it doesn't matter what society says, and it doesn't matter what culture says, and it doesn't matter what the world says, and it doesn't matter what celebrities say, and it doesn't matter what social media says, and it doesn't matter what our friends say, and it doesn't even matter what our relatives say if they're not giving you and I the truth of the scriptures. It only matters what the word of God says. And so God's word is the only thing that has the ability to cut through all that deception. The ultimate plumb line for us is the Bible or the scriptures, not anything else. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Hebrews 4 says, God's word is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit. What does that mean? It helps us understand, no matter how strongly we feel about something, it helps us understand whether we're right or we're wrong based on what the Bible says. The word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. How many of you realize that there are times we're going to have the wrong attitude? And we're going to justify it, though. I'm mad, I have a bad attitude, I'm critical, I'm being judgmental, I'm being whatever, I'm being annoying, I'm being irritating, whatever it is, and then we find ways to justify it. Well, if everybody would just do what I want them to do, everything would be fine. (laughs) Their life would be better, my life would be better, as opposed to just resigning from being the manager of everybody. It's God's word that helps us cut through those attitudes and show us you're wrong. And it doesn't matter how strongly you feel about the other. This is what the Bible says. Does this make sense, everybody? 
Our ultimate place of safety is God's word. The accuracy of whether we're on the right path or on the wrong path is not how we feel about it. It's what God's word has to say about it. So God's word not only thank the Lord for his word that's alive, everybody, because it's his word that exposes the deception of the devil. And here's the thing about being deceived that's really irritating. You don't know it. <laughs> Isn't that deep? You don't know you're being deceived when you're being deceived. That's why it's being deceived. That's hard to quote, but you get what I'm saying. And thank God for his word that is able to do what we can't do and expose that. But here's the third and final thing. God's word not only exposes the deception, but it's also the thing that has the power within it to change our minds, to set us free. To renew, the Bible talks about it in terms of renewing our mind, which literally means our mind is changed. Or in Romans chapter 12, it's, it's this metamorphosis that we go through. Here's what it says in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Paul says, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's actually translated worship. Don't be conformed or squeezed into the mold of this world, but be transformed that's, that word transformed is a Greek word, metamorpho. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. So there's this metamorphosis process that takes place in our minds, in the way that we think, renewing our minds to the word of God. And when that happens, we're able to prove or discern or realize what the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God is. Amen? And I tell you what, you don't want the good will of God. You don't want the acceptable will of God. You and I want and need the perfect will of God. Not just what's acceptable, not just what's, what's it's good. Good has too, one too many O's in it. I'd rather have what's God in our lives than what's good in our lives. Can I get a witness, somebody? And I don't want just something acceptable. It, this is acceptable. Well, we're, okay, I guess it's acceptable. Who wants to live with acceptable with God? I want to live in his perfect will. God has a perfect will for you, your marriage, your home, your family, your kids, your career, your, fight, your life. He has a perfect will. And in that perfect will, there's not enough devils in hell to, to steal it from you, to kill you in it, to rob it from you. There's not a devil in hell that can destroy. Satan himself can't dismantle that when you and I are in the perfect will of God. So I got to give him my mind. Amen? And allow that process to take place. You know, in 1 in first, in first John chapter 3, verse 8, it says that the Son of God appeared. Jesus appeared in one of his, his primary role in coming to the earth. This is so beautiful. Of course, it was to redeem us, to offer us uh, forgiveness and cleansing from sin, to set us. But his ultimate purpose was to destroy the works of the devil which is to steal from us, to kill us, to destroy us. But Jesus, his ultimate, the reason why he appeared, the Bible says, was to destroy. That word destroy in the Greek means to unloose or to unravel Satan's, the things that he's entangled us with, the stuff that he's bound us up with. Jesus came to unravel it, to destroy it. To break it. Matter of fact, one, that, that same word destroy, we actually see, see that same Greek word in the book of Revelation where, where it says that Jesus broke the seals of the book because he was the only one worthy to break those seals. That's the same word to break. Jesus came to break off of our lives the power of the devil. He has no right. Folks, we belong to God. I'm not saying you won't have problems. I'm not saying you won't have challenges or setbacks. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is none of those things have the ability to destroy us, to steal our faith, to rob our joy, to destroy our... None of those things. God has a perfect will and His desires for your marriage to be holy and to be whole and to be healthy. And when you're 80, to love your spouse more than you did when you were 20. That is the perfect will of God. That Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil over your marriage. His desire and His will is for your kids to love God and to serve God all 
all the days of their lives. Don't you ever, ever, ever stop praying and believing and declaring the victory of God, the destruction of the devil over your children as long as there's breath in your body. Don't ever stop declaring that. Don't ever stop believing that. Come on, man. Believe God for your marriage. Believe God for your children. Believe God for your life. You got to believe something. You're believing something anyway. You and I are believing something all the time. This is giving us permission to believe for God's best. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so thankful. We don't want to be led down the wrong path with the way that we think. It's easy to do that. So easy to do that. We know the devil is, is, well, he's greater than us, but he's not greater than you. So thanks for reminding us that our ultimate conflict isn't it isn't the devil in us it's the devil in you and we need to let you step in with your word and bring your victory so I pray that you would encourage the hearts and lives of your people may faith rise in them may there be a indignation that rises up on the inside of them as they if they see anything that has to do with the enemy going on in their lives may there be like a spiritual indignation come up on the inside and say no 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 Uh uh-uh we're not playing this that we grab a hold of your word we keep our eyes on that empty tomb and we submit ourselves to you God because your word says when we submit ourselves to you that the devil flees from us so father thank you for reminding us of that victory in Jesus mighty name amen everybody can we thank God for his word